I'm Nick Zeppos, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I talk with the people shaping and helping us understand our world. My guest today is Holly Tucker, Professor of French and Biomedical Ethics and Society here at Vanderbilt and former recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Research. Holly returned this week from a summer research location in the south of France, just in time for a conversation in my office. Holly is the granddaughter of French immigrants. Her fascination with French history began very early on. Her interest focused upon French med medical practices in the early modern age by the time she received her PhD from my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1996. I was out of there before 20 years, about 20 years before Holly. Holly was appointed assistant professor here during the same year, and she has now forged a brilliant, productive, transformative research portfolio throughout her 21 years at Vanderbilt. She is the author of so many articles and uh, um, has taught thousands of students and made a impact outside of the classroom and in the classroom, but she is also the author of three critically acclaimed books. Her most recent work is City of Light, City of Poison, Magic, and the First Police Chief of Paris. Holly, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, it's a treat. So, um, you know, I've been uh, reading your books, Blood Work, and now this, and this was, uh, I said, well, I'll take this to my one week trip in Wyoming. And mm -hmm. of course, it was done in a day. I couldn't put oh, it wow. down. <laughs> I was looking at the Tetons. But oh, I gazed wow. up, but it was, it's an unbelievable story. Mm -hmm. And as you say in the introduction, it's a true story. The New York Times called it the crime book for the beach. Could you kind of tell us how did you come to this incredible historical narrative? And then as a brilliant scholar, a uh, very erudite colleague, how did you manage to produce a work that has been recognized in the scholarly community and in the New York Times, in the New Yorker, by other publications who point out great works of scholarship and a beach book? Well, I'm not sure about the beach book part, but I think that um, the, the, it's a huge compliment um, to get those types of reviews. In fact, when the New Yorker came out and, you know, said riveting storytelling and uh, artful reconstruction, I will have to tell you, Nick is an academic. Um, I sat with the <laughs> I sat with the issue of the New Yorker, truly for almost a half hour, and and asked my husband husband to pour me a huge bourbon because I really <laughs> couldn't believe what I was reading. Um, Appropriately, a bourbon. A bourbon, <laughs> absolutely. Um, since he's a southerner and we're in the South, um, for me, uh, you know, after I got tenure at Vanderbilt, um, and Vanderbilt's been a fantastic place to forge a career. Um, I really felt this urge to want to continue my scholarship and work in ways that would have more than 10 people reading what I do. Um, and so, you know, I first wrote this book on blood transfusion, blood work, um, a tale of murder, a tale of murder and medicine, the scientific revolution, um, because it was, it was such a compelling story for research. There were lots of mysteries that I needed to figure out. These blood transfusions were being done in the 17th century, which I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I certainly didn't know, even though I'm a specialist in the area that they were animal to human. And then to figure out that there was an unsolved mystery around them, I thought, you know, this is really too good and too interesting to put as an academic journal article. It's not that it's not worthwhile. Um, and I have written about it in more academic context, but these are the types of stories about history that um, could draw readers outside of our small groups of scholars. And, um, and then I also thought about this, is this something that I'm able to write in that way? Um, and I realized, you know, my PhD was actually in literature, in French literature. And it occurred to me I'd spent an entire portion of my early career reading 
some of the greatest works of writing. And um, so I played around with the ideas, is this something that I could do? And I know how to do close readings of literary works, and I was able to understand that the best way to learn how to do something is to study from the masters. And so I started taking books by other people who had had great success in, in their writing and started taking a part in studying what that means to write that way. And I found that it gave me great pleasure to be able to go back in and reconstruct this time period for, for readers um, that I've lived in intellectually for over 20 years of my career. And that's um, how I, I went about looking at City of Light, City of Poison. It's a story about um, Louis XIV, the Sun King, who hires a police chief who um, is in, who intends to root out crime and also light Paris because Paris was dark like every other city in Europe, and that's why we call it the City of Light, because this police chief ended up um, putting thousands of candle lanterns in the city within a year, and it was the yeah. first European city there to be lit. There was a point at which I was reading the book, and we were all kind of sitting around the house, and I said, now I know why it's the city of life. Exactly. You know, yeah. and, and so there were things that helped to explain for me and to explain for other people why Paris has that reputation, among other things. And also, when I think about Paris and when I go to Paris, it's just this breathtaking city. And to go in and take a look at period documents and realize that I would have never wanted to step one foot into Paris in the 17th century. And that Louis XIV realized it was the armpit of his reign. And to get deeper into these stories and realize, wait a second, he wasn't just rooting out crime. He wasn't just lighting the city and cleaning the streets from all the mud and the muck. There was a whole cabal of poisoners and renegade priests and so-called witches who were selling their potions and wares. And the police chief starts to dig around to see what he can do about it. And then he starts to see that all of this stuff has begun to infil infiltrate itself into the king's palace. There's a really great story to be told. Um, the problem was the, it took, this one took four years to write. Um, because the primary records were so overwhelming. It's all manuscript documents um, with the police yeah, chiefs. I wanted to ask you about yeah. that. When I read the, again, the introduction, and then when I read the book, and the energy and the discipline you brought to an incredible archive of materials. Mm. And I still was feel it, like I haven't tapped. Did that surprise you? That the, did the, were the French always, at this time, record keepers? I mean, when you tell me Absolutely. they're taking their depositions and they're recorded and mm -hmm. you're going to put them in the first person rather than... Mm -hmm. That is incredible to me that there is such a voluminous record that you encountered and then to distill it to a narrative. How did you... Do well, a that. colleague of mine has uh, took a picture of me in all at the library. It's a specialist library in Paris, surrounded by these huge tomes because the manuscripts were eventually bound into tomes, and the tomes measure about four feet tall by about two feet wide, and my primary corpus consisted of. 30 of those volumes, not to mention that they are about four feet, I'm sorry, four feet, they felt like it sometimes, four <laughs> inches tall. Um, but surprisingly, I, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to write this because um, I had hoped to write this before I wrote blood work about blood transfusion. Really? So this project was kind mm -hmm. of in the queue? It was in the queue, and I was doing a lot of research in Paris, but the problem that I was finding is that some of the most important records were missing out of those manuscripts. So as Nic Nicolas de Larigny, I call him Nick, it's just easier. Oh, I didn't even think about that, Nick. <laughs> In fact, my mother, that's my mother read, she was a great beta reader sometimes, and she would just put boring in the comments <laughs> or whatever. And um, I got a, d just as a side note, um, since you share his, his name, I got a package in the mail. I, gosh, I was struggling about whether I could finish this book or not. And shows up at the front door here in Nashville and it has lucky bamboo, plants a lucky bamboo. And there's a little note that says, hi, Holly, thank you for sharing 
my story with the whole world. Now get busy and finish it. <laughs> Love, Nick. <That's> <laughs> From Nicolas, the, the police chief. Even the chancellor wouldn't say that sort of note. Can you just imagine if, you know, we all got, yeah. all right, this is good work, colleague. Now get busy and get, get it done. <laughs> Love, Nick, Nick. the <laughs> chancellor. Um, but um, but I, 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 I was having a hard time because um, at, at, at a crucial point, in the in the the history, the story, the true story, Louis the Fourteenth was getting very concerned that Nick, the police chief, was getting too close to some of the uh, the closest people in his entourage, right. and he needed those documents basically to go away. Right. And he asked this highly principled police chief to put them under seal. Mm -hmm. um, and those documents were under seal for over thirty years until Nick died. He um, on the day after his death, he had already arranged his death to have a letter sent to the key, uh, sent to the king, along with a key to access these documents. And Louis XIV, who was the last person who uh, was still alive at that point, he lived a very long life, um, asked those who knew about this affair, of the affair of the poisons, had these documents brought to the cat to Versailles, and he fed them one by yeah. one by one into the fireplace. Yeah, that's one of the most dramatic scenes and when you set the book at the start the kind of tension and the drama of this box being transported mm -hmm. to louis and then that it was of such an explosive nature that mm -hmm. he personally was feeding these pages into the fire um it was my, my reaction, and then as I read the whole book, is, you know, kind of how the Sun King was vulnerable. And, mm -hmm. you know, that even if there's a claim of absolute right to govern and mm -hmm. the divine right of kings, that at the end of the day, there were people in court, there were people out of court, there were kind of high-low bureaucrats mm -hmm. and who could really undermine the king. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of points in the book where some of the people actually go after the king in public. Some of the characters, mm -hmm. I think it was one of his mistresses, mm -hmm husbands mm -hmm. who was away oh yes yeah, and he just goes and it was um actually it, he wanted he he was frequenting brothels right right because um the king was sleeping with his wife yeah and so he's frequenting the husband is frequenting the brothels in the hopes of having his wife catch a translate sexually transmitted disease so the oh, king that's himself right. so the king would also himself, yes. yeah so so i mean there's all this um, mostly loathing going on in the palace. Yeah. The king um, is trying at all turns to both create his legacy and also protect his legacy. And that's why he throws all this stuff in the fire because he wants history to forget. And so what happened, going back to where the origins of this um, came from and why I wrote the last book, Blood Work, before I wrote this one, I despaired because as soon as I figured out that those documents the most detailed and most scandalous documents had been destroyed. I thought there's no, even if I have the, all of those other volumes, the core of what I want to write about is gone. And it was only after I finished blood work and I was sort of swimming around trying to figure out what the ne project, next project was going to be on and um, had uh, worked on a couple of proposals that I pitched to my editor and just couldn't get this one out of my head. Then I realized and discovered that Nicolas de la Reigny was meticulous, and he had been keeping side notes. There's always a paper trail, right? Yeah. So what? Oh, there is. And yeah. he had um, written um, both an inventory of every document that he put into these cartons under seal, and then made descriptions about what they contained, along with some quotes, sort of, you know, cliff notes, if you will, of this, and then even even more helpful. So that's allowed me to write this, write the narrative from the police chief's perspective, what his thoughts on them, these notes in the testimonies were, whether he thought they were trustworthy or not, how they linked up with other documents, mm -hmm. as well as um, drafts of letters that he, summary letters that he wrote to the king and to his ministers. We no longer have the original letters, but we do have 
all of the drafts. And that also gave no. me, it gave me a, both um, an indication of what Louis XIV had put in the fire, um, what Nicolas de la Reynie thought about it, and then also even just through the, the types of markings that he was leaving in the margins, whether it's crossing out, drips, paper crumpled or not, mm. um, you have to be really careful if you're writing nonfiction. I don't invent. Yeah. Um, but, but, you, but you can when you're trying to write um, true stories that are academically based but using narrative and visceral detailing, I'm able to get a sense of, of, of what it would have been like for him to be writing this. Yeah. Right, and so basically, how the physical the physical document corresponds to the words that he was leaving, because we've all done that, right? Um, we've oh, all, yeah. you know, this is stupid, and they cross oh, yeah. out things, and, and, and oh, I can't believe this is. And so, if you have that physical mark trace, mark it, tear it in half, throw it in a pile. Right, and yeah. so that allowed me to understand his greatest moments of frustration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did it surprise you that somebody from such a non-royal, non-aristocratic background. He was mm -hmm. kind of, and he had ambition mm -hmm. that he could make such an impact on history, kind of a bottoms up looking at this non-royal mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. that you've made a pivotal character in French history. Did it surprise you or mm. when you teach to your students, are they surprised because they have such a, you know, our notions of class and mm -hmm. status, mm -hmm. they're trying to translate that into the Sun King. Mm -hmm. Do people of that stature shape history and does that surprise you? That's a really interesting question because if you were to ask Laurigny, and he makes it clear in his documents, is that... He, he's not doing anything but supporting the monarchy, supporting his king, and and trying to protect his king and trying to make his king look good. But along the way, and that's that was the other reason why I really wanted to, to tell this story from the police chief's perspective. It's not, you know, it's not first person, it's third person, but to use him as the driving narrative force because... Um, in doing what is his job, right? He's re I, I really, I really like this guy at the mm -hmm. beginning, and because he's so committed, he's detailed. I mean, he is the perfect sort of public servant. He wants all of the eyes dotted, all of the t's crossed, and um, and he's working toward the good of. Parisians. He wants to get those streets cleaned. He he ends up putting in one of the first sewers. Paris didn't have any sewers in the 17th century. He lights the city. Um, and as he starts to get closer into this darker world, he has to make some really important moral choices about how far he's willing to go to protect his king. And for me, trying to have, trying to understand how this really upright guy ends up transitioning and and being present and ordering some of the most horrific types of torture. Torture. All for what I think he would understand to be the good cause. Right. What is what is the um, what is, what are the ethical shifts, changes, questions, journeys that one can take from being someone who's really upstanding to being somebody that I think we would say, I mean I've had friends say those tortures are really hard to read, and they are. Oh, no, they were. They, they are very, very hard to read. And the record, you know, it's, um, what's also when you get into the records, um, so they're written all in third person, um, um, states that she did not, uh, dot, 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 cried, oh, my God, please stop, heaven, Jesus, help me, right? So it's not done with quote marks, but the way, and I was, I, that's the nice thing about being with in Vanderbilt with a lot of people. I ran it past some some historians that I really appreciate, Dan Sharfstein, yeah. Joel Harrington, who both write also for larger audiences. Yeah. And I said, here's my primary document. Is it okay for me to turn these into first person? I'm like, absolutely, because there's nothing in there that you're inventing. Right. That adds, I think, the the first person voices in the dialogue makes it even harder to read because you can hear i mean i see the exclamation marks and then i think my readers hear yeah. the exclamations but um 
as I read it, I really try to avoid the worst sorts of presentism mm. and mm -hmm. to kind of start to think about class and gender. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come at the project of females and women mm -hmm. and power or mm -hmm. lack of power mm -hmm. in the in the in the project and and um, just making sure that the project wasn't you know kind of written for a contemporary audience but that mm -hmm. it didn't come across as women kind of with witchcraft mm -hmm. and no agency and power how did you come at the gender questions that's a, when you took the project on and then when you executed it to be to act with integrity in your own mind mm -hmm. about women and power and mm -hmm. you know kind of the 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 place they're put in in this society and mm -hmm. how poison becomes a tool of mm -hmm. power across gender and used mm -hmm across class as well. That's a really good question about because you know the majority of the people accused of poison um, in witchcraft of course were women and um, of those I would say that a, at least 75 percent of those women were from the lower classes. Yeah. Um, and so what do you do? How do you write a story around that when um, it, as someone who works you know, in, in early modern cultural studies, who's an academic, right. um, who has opportunities to interact with all of our wonderful sociologists here, other people, you know, in um, contemporary studies, yeah, there are real questions to be asked, right? Were these women guilty? Was this part of some other um, uh, epistemological trend in the society? Yes and yes. But is my job really to find the answers and tell people how they should read it? Or is my job to present things in such a way that leaves it open to actually where it begs discussion, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. that's what I learned in the last book too, um, yeah. because there were really strong, I, you know, I, I would say, uh, particularly because interestingly enough, the, the 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 last book blood work was all about biomedical technical innovation right right and 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 the ways in which a society um responds rejects integrates um from a variety of different perspectives economic religion um gender do you name it um and i i know where i stand i know where my interpretation is but that's i think the other part about writing books like these as someone who's in the classroom I don't ever, I know that some, you know, some people may disagree with me, but I don't see that my role, none of us are neutral. None of us right. can ever be um, no, we're, we're, politically neutral at all. But my job as an educator at Vanderbilt is to make sure that there's, that I'm asking interesting questions, providing um, uh, texts as praxis for my students to mm -hmm. be able to dig through and then let them come to conclusions and not trying to guide them to my conclusion. Right. Because I, with our students, I actually find that if I would come into the classroom with an argument that I think that they just need to swallow yeah. whole, um, actually I'll be coming out learning about 16. Yeah, I, other, say, I no, mean, I, I, no, it will be, no, it will be humbling. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's another reason why I'm really enjoying um, balance, marrying, if you will, the, the deep, um, archival research that I do and um, writing to what we call trade audiences to yeah. larger, um, you know, larger print runs yeah. and um, and doing book tours is I, I get to be a teacher outside of the classroom yeah. in neat yeah. ways. I think it has tons of resonance and integrity. Oh, that makes me happy. I, I really, that. because to go into these archives and then the French that you encounter in the archives is a 17th, 18th mm -hmm. century French, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not like walking the streets of Paris today. You know, so, but... and, uh, I just, 
to put that much effort into the project and then say this is a teaching experience for me and then my students hmm. when i go to a bookstore um i think that's the best of the academy it's the best of the humanist work it's the best of trans institutional work because it's embedded in a very deep source of material that people can argue about but it grows out of this richness of scholarship that i i think is is just breathtaking um you're you know a modernist or you do you go early modern mm -hmm. i don't know how do you you know, kind of characterize yourself. What I think is really fascinating, I mean, I think your work is just incredible, but how you're also working with these, and maybe I'm overreading it, but these themes of science, religion, mm -hmm. and witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And you're, you know, you're kind of writing during the Enlightenment, you're writing mm -hmm. during you know, what's called the scientific revolution. And you're coming to grips with something which is this dualism that still exists, but existed very much at the time where doing science or being pious mm -hmm. was, there was a complexity to it. I mean, you have these priests who are engaged in the mm -hmm. shenanigans, the conspiracies, and then in Bloodworks you have the same sort of conflict between well, what makes us human? Why, why, why are the dogs in here? Mm -hmm. So religion and science and... Um, it's a know, muddy mess, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but I found the farmer, you know, when you kind of would go through the apothecary, it was like you had a CSI to it. Like, <laughs> okay, he's going to do, we didn't have mass spec, but mm -hmm. this what are what's in here, take it to them. So I think this bridging of science and faith and almost, you know, kind of alchemy mm -hmm. is just incredible when most people want to see, oh, this is the time of the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. well, and it's like, well, let's just be a little careful here. History's a little messier is what I, you point out. I think that we've gotten well beyond, for those of us working in these time periods, we've gotten well beyond the idea, and that's it's new, I, I would probably say over the last 25, mm -hmm. 30 years, we've gotten over the idea that there can be um, and that there ever was a radical break between science and society, even down to, um, we're working, I mean, when we say, you know, we're at the height of the scientific revolution, that we've increasingly saw that somebody like Robert Boyle, mm -hmm. father of chemistry, right? We would never imagine that Boyle would actually be doing experiments on the Philosopher's Stone. And when, yeah. when um, studies started coming in on, you know, some of the other things that he was working on, transmutation of metals and things, it was, it was, it, it was really uncomfortable in the history of science. Yeah. community because how could that be happening these are these are legends who came in and sort of chucked away all of the superstition but we're not at a point here where we can easily divide astronomy from astrology alchemy from chemistry right and that's those for me that's and even when I look at the modern period, I get really excited about looking at the idea of paradigm shifts mm -hmm. right and and that they happen imperceptibly. Uh, without without us even noticing it. And one of the things I try to talk a lot to my students um, in my courses on early modern science and early modern medicine, it's fun to watch them laugh, right? Yeah. And so pre-formationism, any genetics textbook yeah. will start with, you know, the, the tiny, the homunculus, the yeah. little tiny, the tiny yeah. guy in the yeah. head of the sperm. Yeah. It gets about two pages. Yeah. And then typically it's like, oh, but then yeah. we discovered DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and... I actually love watching my students start with that moment of laughter, going, I can't believe, yeah. really? I mean, leeches, yeah. and yeah. really, they were doing this and that. And then over the course of the semester, they start to get more and more into the mindset of the time period. That's what, that's what I like to try to do, is help us to understand how this, this, this community, a given community, a given time, may be thinking in all of its contradictions, um, so that certain things have to make sense such that 
how we, our modern worldview, could never begin to make sense to them. So that um, the types of questions that we can ask are always um, um, bounded by the worldview in which we're living in, which necessarily, because that controls the questions we can ask generally, that will control the types of answers that we'll get. And so what does that mean for us now in the modern period? Things that we've become naturalized, that we can't think of thinking in other ways about right. certain things. There will be a time, and we see it in places like Vanderbilt and other great universities, where creative thinkers in the labs, um, in the humanities classrooms, in hospitals, doing um, sometimes the most odd projects you would never imagine looking at new ways i was just reading view today new ways of um of of charging batteries yeah. for example that could have been unthinkable could you even imagine yeah. but times change and creative thinking has to happen and i love watching students be able to help to locate with me that moment it's not one great man yeah. Um, suddenly deciding that, oh, the heavens opened up and I get this great message, you know, William Harvey. William Harvey didn't, on his own, discover circulation oh. of blood in 1638. William Harvey happened to be the right person at the right time collecting this long trajectory that was in the making toward getting to that point. So I'm always wondering when I look at my colleagues who do science and medicine, what are we in the making of, right? Mm -hmm. What new questions are we gonna ask? So th I think that's why I like to work in this time period because it's such a mucky mess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Holly, I've been your colleague, you know, for your whole time at Vanderbilt. And one of the other attributes of your work on books, on teaching, on graduate dissertations is what we call trans-institutional work. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes will say, well, interdisciplinary work, or we talk about trans-institutional. How, over your career, and does it come from just being a really curious, brilliant academic that you're I want to talk to the people in genetics. I want to talk to the people in astronomy. I want to talk to the people who do hematology. I want to talk to the people who do philology. How did you make yourself such a university scholar? When did hmm. that light bulb go off? And, you know, you and I are both full professors. We're tenured. Mm -hmm. We both came through the ranks. Mm -hmm. And so you know, maybe the freedom of having tenure, but what would you tell our junior colleagues and other people about this university and the opportunities to get mm -hmm. out of your silo? How did you do it? I think it's a series of calculated risks that you make. Um, I came in, my PhD was in French literary studies. I looked at one author who wrote between 16, oh gosh, why don't I remember, 1636 and 1643 or something. And it was at a time when the academy was um, really not focusing that much on interdisciplinary mm -hmm. studies. Um, but I was at a place like Wisconsin mm -hmm. with one of the best history of science sure, programs. Yeah. And I was working in a time period that, you know, early scientific revolution. And I thought, there's just so many things I don't know that I would just love to know. And um, not thinking, I mean, it didn't play out in my dissertation at all, but taking advantage of the fact that there are a lot of people who are a heck of a lot smarter than I am, who have a lot of things to teach me. And I think that's why I did become a, a college professor, because I'm as much a student, I know it's cliche to say this, I'm as much a student as I am a teacher. And I learned from my students, I learned from my colleagues, and to be able to sit, I mean, I still can't believe this, I counted all my fruit flies in a genetics class here. Why not? You know, <laughs> why not? Yeah. You know, I just spent my leave a year and a half ago in um, the MPH program. Why not, right? Why not understand? It's more also for me is not ever to be able to say, well, I'm going to become a geneticist. Right. That, that, that ship sailed a long time yeah. ago when, oh, yeah. when I barely survived my math classes yeah. in college. But um, 
nor am I going to be an epidemiologist or anything. Mm -hmm. But I'm really interested in, again, these paradigms, the way people think and how knowledge is structured. And the only way that you can really understand that is to become a real student with all the humility, because it's really humiliating. No, it's humbling is a better word, is to be in a class where you don't know anything and you've got people in there who are 15, 20 years younger than you. Um, so I think for me is, um, is not focusing on those things that I know, but focusing on those things I, I I know that I don't know that I really want to learn. Um, my first book was not at all my dissertation, which was very scary to do. I remember. <laughs> I remember. That's right. Now you were provost when I, I got your, tenured. Yeah, you were well, my. Well, I mean, I just remember being, and then as I've gotten to know you, just that somebody took the risk because, you know, when you're looking at files, it's like, okay, can this person grow out of the dissertation? I mean, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you look at, and mm -hmm. you've mentored, obviously, many uh, fine graduate students, but it's, I, I, I just remember, it's like, wow, she's going to take the risk of going totally different direction from her dissertation. And that's, that's pretty unusual, mm -hmm. and it worked, and that's been kind of your way of taking some risk and saying, I think I have this idea. I think I can execute it. And, and why not see what happens yeah. with it? And at the pre-tenure level, um, I knew that I would forever regret not pursuing that line of thinking when I had the support and the resources of a great university. And if... I failed at it, then I gave it my best. If if I did it, I did a good job at it and the university wasn't ready to recognize it, I still did my best. But no matter what happened out of it, I would still have this I mean, nobody loses these things. Once you once you find once you once you pursue lines of thinking, that's knowledge no one can take away from you, yeah. right? And, and so I think that for me is is sort of a it's a balanced game of risk taking and just knowing that I don't know any better. <laughs> well, I, I I would say the the two things that I think are profoundly important are number one, we are all coming to school every day to learn, mm -hmm. and. I think we, we as professors are certainly privileged to be able to say, well, it's kind of our role to do a syllabus and mm -hmm. stand up in the class. But most of us are really frank about coming into work and so often saying, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. saying that that's the day I say I know all that. I've written every piece of scholarship that I want. I've read every book. I've gone mm -hmm. through every archive that's the time, I mean, really shut it down. Do you know, I had that I experience mean, in graduate graduate courses. I used to be sort of the go-to person for our uh, graduate methodology and literary theory class. Mm -hmm. And I loved it at first. I taught it for several years and I yeah. adored it. And, you know, when you get these really bright graduate students digging around critical liter literary theory, really abstract stuff, Derrida yeah. oh, for, yeah. you know, for crying out loud, and yeah. Levi, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, and then the, all this post-structuralism and stuff, and it used to get me, it still does, but in the classroom I got so excited, and there was one day with a bright group of graduate students, and they were just diving into it with the most delight and um, energy, and I knew that I had to stop teaching this course when I'm listening, and I was like, yeah, okay, so when I get home, let's see. Yeah, I need to I need to get that laundry stored and mm -hmm. started. And then I wonder if my daughter's put the dog out yet. Yeah. That's when you stop and you say, yeah. okay, now you're not serving anybody at that point. Yeah. So yeah. I pass the course off to a colleague who teaches it <laughs> more brilliantly than I do. And and so with each with each book project too, is I don't I think that's also why I decided with blood work is to is to move from an academic press to W. W. Norton, one of the best presses oh, yeah. in the United States. Um, that wasn't anything that that wasn't my end goal. It just I just want to see what will happen, and and then always be delighted by the results because you, if you don't expect it and then it happens, all you can just do is be yeah. is just be giddy, delighted, and surprised. Yeah, the, the other thing that I think you, the other point I wanted to reinforce is, you know, we do so much 
And so often, appropriately, it'll be, well, there's a new cancer drug that was just discovered, or there's a new material that is superconducting. And, and I think when I read your work, you have discovered things. And, and you, oh. <laughs> you have created new knowledge, and that new knowledge moves forward the project of understanding who we all are. And, you know, I, I think these sorts of projects are as important for a great university as, you know, all the other great stuff that happens here in science and engineering. Mm -hmm. But this, to me, is a profound contribution to new knowledge for the specialist, but also for so many other readers, mm -hmm. whether at the beach or whether they're somewhere else. So um, let's back up also to ask about, you just kind of glanced over the, well, yeah, I did go back and get a master's in public health. No, I haven't done it. Are you, I, are I, you doing it now? Um, I, did, I took the first year of the yeah. coursework. Yeah. Um, and then for um, some family issues, I was on leave yeah. um, following that. Um, so so the year um, that I spent during during my leave, um, I took it, Now you can talk to the professors took epidem epidemiology kicked my butt. Um, but in biostatistics, that went OK. Cool. Um, but and it, it was uh, what is it, you know, healthcare surveillance and things. Um, so for me, it just seemed like something having an opportunity to interact with colleagues at the medical school, which I've been doing for a while. Right. Um, a little less now this year because I've been um, so busy with the, the book and other things. Um, I just really wanted to get a sense of how our colleagues thought. And um, so I got to spend time with a bunch of younger doctors, um, you know, listening to how they how they go about their research methodology, which it's a very different way mm -hmm. to approach knowledge and knowledge making than mm -hmm. how I approach it. Um, yeah. So I don't know what the question was, but I, I, no, I, a I lot of people thought that. I was crazy. No, I mean, I think it just shows to me your passion and intellectual curiosity about how do I equip myself to be a better teacher? How to, to understand my work better, to go down paths unexplored in the next project that I have. Um, this book to me is also just exhibit, you know, 200 million of why writing great history is so important. That, and, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know who we are until we know where we were. And this project of, you know, just opening up people's eyes and minds to what was Paris like and how is this Sun King trying to build his legacy? And, mm -hmm. you know, what is a society that's trying to operate in a rule of law way with predictability, but with an absolute monarchy? Mm -hmm. How is that process really negotiated? And then mm -hmm. how does faith and science interact with, you know, pretty strong beliefs in alchemy and witchcraft and. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. potions and things like that. Um, what is, what else is on the agenda, Holly? I mean, what, there must be 10 other projects knocking around, or can you give us a little bit of a well, preview um, on, on what's on your that's mind? That's always the, the question that makes people nervous because, oh, really? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> really? Can't I just take a break? Well, uh, I'm but, just waiting for the next one. Um, I'm so hooked. Well, you know what, as so I spent this last summer in France. Um, I'm working on two different projects. I, I, I tend to keep them a little closer to the chest until I have a sense about where they're shaping and where okay. they're going. But what I will say, um, I have two projects in the works right now. One is requiring me to, to spend a fair bit of time in, um, in archives in Marseille, mm -hmm. and particularly looking at Marseille is it um, because one I thought okay I just need to get out of Paris for a while, <laughs> um, and 
um, Marseille, of course, in the in the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries, was and still is a major port, sure. and so there's a lot of shipping. There are a lot of um, economic aspects and also very human aspects coming in out of that part port that will have direct impact on how the south of France developed mm -hmm. in the 17th century, um, as well as, of course, it's not just economic, but it's also religious, because you have um, a fair amount of, of religious conflict that, that looks an awful lot like the legacies of the Crusades that get transformed then into into the into the economic so I'm digging through the archives right now trying to find the story I think there's something there that's mm -hmm. that's where my research always starts is I think there's something <laughs> there I don't know what I'll find and there's another project um, that I'm working on right now it has more to do with Paris and and it's um, questions of early collecting you know what people oh. find what they do with it and how Objects end up carrying century-long um, mm -hmm. meaning, um, and there I'm closer to to the to the main historical figures that I want to be working with. Um, is there enough of a story? I don't know. I mean, before between blood work and then City of Light, City of Poison, I actually spent a summer working on the guillotine. <laughs> thinking there's got to be a really yeah. great story <laughs> yeah. there and there are really great stories and you know it's uh, there's stories of the French Revolution and then I looked at it and I couldn't find a I couldn't find a consistent narrative thread and then after a while I thought do I really want to spend the next four years working with the heads chopped off no not really <laughs> so I, I my my next I, I do work on goals though my next um, goal is to get something that looks like a clear, draft of of the next book by um in the next 16 months yeah. because it may be a crummy draft but at least i'll have it i'll know where i'm going well with you're it. you're a true scholar because usually when you ask a brilliant scholar writer what's your next project they start to feel guilty or I don't really want to talk about it yet because I'm going to execute <laughs> it so i apologize for no. making you doubt that but i just i just uh I kind of wanted to start thinking when my next favorite book would come out. And well, I can promise you, Professor is Tucker every, usually, I'm really structured in my writing as I, yeah. I write 500 words a day, even if I don't know what I'm writing about. And then I always sit with primary documents for at least a half hour every day. And so, um, and then, uh, then invariably something has to come from it. Cause yeah. if you don't show up, if you don't show up, nothing happens. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, Holly, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts and certainly the products of your brilliant intellectual pursuits with the Vanderbilt community and across the globe. We have a lot of Zeppos Report fans, and I'm sure they'll enjoy this. You can download this and other episodes of the Zeppos Report at vu.edu slash zeppos report vu.edu slash zeppos dash report. Thanks a lot, Holly. Thanks, Nick.